live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Hit and miss thunderstorms out there tonight. Find out how many of us are actually going to get wet. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kimberly Gill, live in Washington, D.C., where just a little more than 24 hours ago, a gunman opened fire on Republican members of Congress. The baseball game that they were practicing for will go on as scheduled right here behind me. We'll have a live report coming up in just a bit. All right, Kim, and tragedy in Macomb County, a 19-month-old toddler drowns in a canal after walking away from a family barbecue. And you can only imagine this family is still in shock in Harrison Township after their baby girl wandered away and fell into a canal behind a home and drowned. This happened on Malice Street last evening around 7 during dinner. Jason Colthorpe uh, spoke with the girl's father today. And Jason's here now with this horrendous situation, Jason. It really is, Devin. This is a canal that connects to Lake St. Clair and the father devastated, as you can imagine and I want you to listen to him in his own words in his own raw emotion talk about the moments when he couldn't find his daughter and then of course when he did it's so hard to not be able to believe that she's not here I can hear calling me right now saying dad 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 a father trying to come to grips today with the loss of his 19 month old daughter Chloe Lawson the family was barbecuing last night when someone noticed Chloe wasn't with the other kids. Kids like to hide, so we figured she was probably in her in her closet or behind the couch playing with toys or something like that. And and as we kept running around the house, she never appeared and it, it, it freaked me out, so I, I ran out the front door screaming to the neighbors, um, you know, have you seen my little girl? And nobody said nothing. And then that's when somebody screamed. Chloe had fallen in the canal behind the house. I tried to give her mouth to mouth resuscitation. I, I pumped her chest. I just, there's nothing I could do. She was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Today, Lawson has a message for anyone looking to place blame. For those that, you know, that think that they can judge somebody, you can't because you, as many times as you can scald your child and tell them no or put them in the house and make them cry, they will find a way. Thank you. Thanks, Echoing that same thought today, don't take your eyes off your kids in those situations even for a second. That's all it takes. By the way, Macomb County Sheriff's de detectives still investigating this. No word on if there could be any charges here. Devin. You know, Jason, uh, kids do wander around and it just does seem that they are often drawn to water, right? And in this case, even a little bit more, uh, he said his daughter, Chloe, loved water, but also loved the boats. And there was a boat that was up and then all of a sudden a boat had gone out in the water and he thinks she saw the boat and kind of wandered that way. And like they say, for one instance, yeah. you look the other way and children can wander. Well, it's just gut-wrenching. All right, Jason. All right, let's uh, turn our thoughts now to the weather because we do have some storms moving through right now. Yeah, we've seen some pretty heavy downpours this afternoon. Let's get over to Ben. Anything severe headed our way? Uh, not right now, uh, Ryan and Devin. You know, it's been the haves and have nots here on Four Life Radar, and most of us are have nots uh, because there are very few spots that are getting measurable rain right now. Uh, so far, it's been mostly our north and metro zones, but you get up here into Sanilac County and there's a good stripe of rain from Marlette out to Lexington. Couple lightning strikes out there, too, and some of that rain's intense. We're watching these storms to see if they start expanding. Finally seeing a couple lightning strikes out there towards Howell, but it's been a whole lot of nothing here across our west and south zones. Maybe a shower north of Morency and that's about it. So most of the activity will remain from Detroit north. Temperatures falling into the 70s tonight, but fear not. We've got more chances of rain coming up in the seven day forecast. Devin. All right, Ben, let's get back to Washington. This is a live look at Nationals Park in Washington, D.C. And less than two hours from now, this park is going to be packed for the annual congressional baseball game. We expect it's going to be an emotional night on the heels of yesterday's shooting at the Republican practice. Kimberly Gill live outside Nationals Park. Uh, before we get to the game, Kim, let's talk about uh, Matt Micah, the uh, Detroit native who was injured uh, in yesterday's shooting. 
Yeah, Devin, good evening to you uh, from Washington. And yes, we do have an update on Matt Micah's uh, condition, and it is good news. The hospital has just upgraded his status from critical to serious. Now, in a statement, his family wrote earlier today, it says, quote, Matt was shot multiple times in his chest and arm and suffered massive trauma. He requires assistance to breathe and will need additional surgeries. Matt has been alert conscious and communicating through notes. So that is certainly uh, very good news to hear from Matt Micah's family. Now to tonight's game, a long-standing tradition that has usually been just for fun and to raise a little bit of money for charity, uh, but both players on both sides of the aisle will tell you the game tonight uh, may be just the most important game that they've ever played. As ground crews get Nationals Park ready for tonight's game, Federal agents, along with search dogs, scour a different field in Virginia. The place where just a day earlier, police say 66-year-old James Hodgkinson, armed with a rifle and pistol, unleashed a firestorm on Republican members of Congress. We heard pop, 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 and everybody yelled, he's got a gun. Head for cover. As the lawmakers scattered, dozens of rounds sprayed the field. Four people were hit, including House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, who remains in critical condition after multiple surgeries. Congressional aide Zach Barth was shot in the leg. Everything around me starts popping. Uh, I feel a pain in my leg. I look down, I've been hit. Uh, at that point, my fight or flight kicks in. Looking for cover, he rushed to the dugout. And tonight, he and others who were targeted in the attack will be back in the dugout and on the field. The members deciding the charity game will go on like it has for about 100 years. It's baseball, it's America, and when America gets punched, America punches back, and we'll do that tonight. And while it will be the Republicans on one side of the diamond and Democrats on the other, there will be just one team on the field tonight. We will use this occasion as one that brings us together and not separates us further. Unity in a place that hasn't seen much of that lately. Indeed. Now, uh, Michigan will be very well represented on the field tonight. Let's take a quick look at uh, exactly who's playing from our area. On the GOP side, we've got Representative Mike Bishop from Rochester, uh, Representative Jack Bergman from the Traverse City area. He's going to be playing, too. We spoke to both of them uh, yesterday and today. And Representative John uh, Molinar from Midland will also be out on the field. On the Democratic side, Representative Dan Kildee of Flint will be playing as well. And we will have much more coming up uh, at 6 o'clock here from Nationals Park. We will uh, tell you everything that's going on for tonight's game and show you who the real winners of tonight's game will be. Again, that's ahead here at 6 o'clock. Until then, we'll send it back to you in Detroit, Devin. In fact, Kim, that's the interesting thing here. Even though they've been doing this for more than 100 years, typically this game doesn't get a whole lot of attention outside Washington. But now, so much more attention, not just on the game, but on the charities that it, uh, that it supports. On the charities that it supports, you're right, and uh, the number of people that are buying tickets for it because they they want to support, and they're, yeah. uh, from what I understand, has uh, been a GoFundMe fund uh, set up so that people that can't come to the game, that they can also uh, give to these charities that are involved because yeah. it has gotten so much publicity. So good news on that front as far as those charities go. Sure is. All right, Kim, we'll get back to you in just a bit. Uh, back here tonight, dozens of Metro Detroit families making a three-and-a-half-hour drive to visit loved ones that were taken into custody in last weekend's ICE arrest. Perhaps the last time they see those yeah. loved ones. Just hours after the arrest, those immigrants were taken to a detention facility in Youngstown, Ohio. Our Priya Mann took that trip as well and joins us now live from there. And Priya, is it a foregone conclusion that all of these detainees are going to be deported? Well, there is hope prevailing here. As you may know, breaking news today, the ACLU did file a federal lawsuit hoping to stop those deportations. More than 100 Metro Detroiters housed here at the Northeast Ohio Correctional Center. Families have been told over the next three days they have one hour to see their loved one, and families have been trickling in all day. We spoke to one family from Warren here to see their dad. Just bring him home. That's all we ask for. Bring him home. A Warren family traveled to Youngstown, Ohio to say goodbye to their dad, 47-year-old Moyad Barash. <laughs> On Sunday, Barash was pulled over and detained by ICE agents while driving with his 7-year-old daughter. 
We just can't believe this is going to happen. Barash was among more than 100 people detained in ICE raids across Metro Detroit. The Warren man had a green card when he came to the U.S. as a child. There's not a day that he does not laugh. When he's mad at you, he still cracks a smile. It's the cutest thing. At 17, he was convicted for drug possession and a weapons charge. Since then, he has not been in trouble with the law. Didn't think our community would bleed so much over something so crazy that's happening right now. The father of five is Chaldean. His family fears he will be tortured and killed by ISIS if he's deported to Iraq. If they're going to be tortured, murdered, jailed, we don't know. What if we never see them again? And these kids expect to see their dad, hopefully not for the last time, but they're expected to have a visit with him here at this facility tomorrow. Now, families are being told to pack their loved ones a 40-pound bag. They'll have one hour to visit with them before they're deported. We're hearing those deportations could happen as early as next week. Reporting live from Youngstown, Ohio, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. And Priya, we do want to know a little more about this lawsuit. And also, for these families, was this a day that they felt was looming over them? Did they fear that this could happen? Well, Rhonda, you can't even imagine what that three-and-a-half-hour drive to this facility has been like for these families. As for that lawsuit, the ACLU is suing ICE, saying that Chaldeans, uh, Catholic Iraqis, as well as um, Shiite Muslims are in real danger here. If they go back to Iraq, they say they will face uh, religious prosecution. And on those grounds, the ACLU is saying that these deportations should be halted. Now, coming up at 6 o'clock, we're going to speak to a woman whose husband has been named as a plaintiff in this lawsuit and we'll have much more on the legal maneuvers now being used to try to stop these deportations. All right, Priya, we'll see you then. Thank you. Meanwhile, two members of Governor Snyder's cabinet appear in court facing criminal charges in the Flint water crisis. And new tonight, a look at who could be next because investigators are saying their job is far from over. And terrifying moments at the U.S. Open Golf Tournament in Wisconsin. What caused a blimp to virtually fall out of the sky as people could only watch in horror. But first, this man spent 42 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. How he never gave up trying to clear his name and the first thing he plans to do as a free man when we continue in just a moment. New at 6. He was hobbling around the 7-Eleven when his sticky fingers got the best of him. He's a lover. You won't believe what he stole and where he hid it. Also, a local dad busted for driving drunk with his children in the car. And what we've discovered about his driving record will raise a lot of eyebrows. That's coming up at 6. After spending 42 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit, this video right here that you see behind me is Ladora Watkins, his first moment of freedom. Watkins was convicted back in 1976 for murder. Since then, he has been working tirelessly to clear his name, and Rod Maloney was there today as Watkins walked out of jail. An incredible moment, Rod. Yeah, it really was, Devin. I mean, we've seen a lot of these cases recently, but here's the thing. Imagine getting up every morning and trudging off to the library, not for 10 or 20 or 30 or even 40 years, but more than that. He did it. Lodora Watkins made his own success today, and he walked out a free man. He emerged from the Wayne County Jail after a court hearing today, all smiles, and grateful to the Western Michigan University Cooley Law Innocence Project. Earlier, he'd hugged his nephew and daughter for the first time as a free man. It's kind of unbelievable, but I'm feeling great. And I expected for this to happen. I didn't think it would take 41 plus years, you know, but here we are and we're just fulfilling what's supposed to happen. Ladora looked much different behind bars. His 1976 murder conviction and the death of a Highland Park school teacher tossed today. He single-handedly convinced the state Supreme Court hair analysis evidence was faulty. How did he persevere? I didn't have no choice. You know, when, when I first set out and tried to do the work, it was overwhelming. And so it, it took me years, you know, to get to this point, you know, but I stuck with it and with the support of my family, with the support of a lot of people that I met along the way, was able to pull it off. He said he has no time for bitterness for those who put him away all those years and for all the legal training he's gained. You thinking about taking the bar? No, 
No. I don't want to see another law book for, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I had a stack of law books and I gave them all away before I left. I don't want to touch another law book. Now, you can see him happy there, but he did say that there's one bit of sadness today, and that is the one thing he cannot have is the one thing he really wants, and that's a hug from his mother who died 10 years ago. Back to you. Well, what is uh, next for him then, Rod? Well, okay, uh, first stop, a Chinese restaurant. There's no Chinese <laughs> food in prison, and that's what he yeah. wanted to have for dinner. He said a lot of other food he wants to try as well. Uh, but then he's gonna spend time with his sister, uh, actually, yeah, it was his, uh, his cousin, forgive me, uh, in Cleveland because that's where she lives. And he's going to spend at least 30 days, maybe more, just decompressing from all of this yeah. and then deciding precisely what it is that he wants to do. But no law school, which was a great question. <laughs> I loved it. All right, Rod, we wish him uh, now all the best. Well, uh, I look over and I see Rhonda, Ben, and I have an overwhelming urge to make breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying not to say good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes you can have cereal for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Why not? not? Kind of cool. Great to have you with us. Yeah, it's nice good to be here. here. Of You're course, covering a Kimberly. Shift today. I know, and I'll be back day. tomorrow morning too. So tough. Just and tough. live here. The uh, rain hopefully will be done by then. Yep. Uh, but we do have some showers out there, and in fact, in some cases, too much rain. You see that uh, what's going on up in Sanilac County? Uh, they've issued a uh, National Weather Service issued a flood advisory uh, for the southern end of the county. This is in that green shaded area until 7:15. The radar is estimated more than two inches of rain has already falling and uh, fallen and it is still raining up there uh, between Marlette and Peck on out towards the river. There are some lightning strikes out here, but severe weather is not the problem. It's the amount of rain as the cells sort of built a uh, back built uh, as, uh, as they moved off to the east. So we'll be watching that very carefully as we get through uh, the next hour or so. Uh, and again, some of those estimates uh, possibly as much as two inches of rain. Got this on storm pins from Wayne and I tell it's been a while since I've been in grade school, but I remember this smell when the rain hits that hot asphalt or recess. Oh yeah, uh, and you can see the steam coming off the parking lot out there. So some of us have gotten some rain, others not so lucky. We have multiple chances in the forecast, but we're also going back to the at least near 90 in a couple spots uh, as we get it forward into the next couple days. So going into Friday, it's going to look a lot like today where we start out dry and then we start seeing those thunderstorm chances blossom in the afternoon and evening. Saturday is not going to look a whole lot different. Sunday will be a little bit of a change in the pattern as a cold front gets closer to us. Our chances of rain on Father's Day probably in the morning ahead of this cold front and then that front passes through. We should be dry for the second half of Sunday. So we'll get 67 tonight. Thunderstorms ending early. In fact, by sunset, a lot of these should be done. Our four zone forecast has temperatures just a little bit warmer tomorrow as we go to 87 or 88 here in our metro zone. Not a whole lot of difference uh, south of Michigan Avenue towards the state line. Close to 90, but not quite there from Marincy to Lambertville. High temperatures generally in the mid 80s here in our west zone. Flint's at 85, Ann Arbor's at 87. And and no 70s uh, in our north zone. It's all 80s here, even out towards the lakes, 82 in St. Clair and 85 in Lexington. Warm spots will be 87 here in Waterford to Macomb. Seven day forecast gets it's a little bit warmer uh, as we head towards the upcoming Father's Day Sunday. We do start to see a pattern change here on Monday as high temperatures only in the 70s. And then we get to those uh, shower chances returning for the first day of summer as we get into Wednesday. So with thunderstorms, multiple spots in the forecast. Let's check in with Andrew Humphrey, who is out at Meyer and Royal Oak for our last severe weather radio day of the season. Andrew mom. Yeah, get ready. Just Andrew. Hello. Hey, good afternoon, Ben. We're right here at the Meyer and Royal Oak and it's weather radio day. You're exactly right. We already got a crowd lining up here. Wave and say hi, everyone. Good to see you. Everyone's in for these NOAA weather radios. They can be lifesavers. They're smoke alarms for your home, for your family and loved ones in the event of bad weather. And these weather radios, guess what? We got them at a discount. They're $5 off, 30 instead of 35. And also, we got batteries that are for free. We'll load up with batteries. And we got programmers that are here for free as well. Made by Midland Radio, one of the best radio companies in the United States. We're here at the Meyer and Royal Oak, best grocery store in town. And with folks lining up, it is your time right now on this weather radio day to think about yourself, keeping your family safe, keeping dad safe with Father's Day coming up. Come on downtown. We'll say hi to you. We'll get you one of these NOAA weather radios at a discount here at the Meyer and Royal Oak.
Ben, back to you in the studio. Yeah, and it's also worth remembering if you can't make it out to Meyer today, uh, that discount is going to be available throughout the entire summer yeah. at any Meyer location. All right, good deal. Yeah. All right, cool. That would be a nice Father's yeah. Day gift. That's true. It's that may be in something else. The red one with the crank is the, the you know, yes, the, the, oh. you make your own electricity. Yeah, really cool. Perfect. <laughs> well, Chrysler issuing a recall tonight on one of the most popular vehicles. What certain minivan owners need to know about a potentially dangerous defect coming up. Speaking of danger, people could only look in horror. What caused a blimp to fall out of the sky at the U.S. Open Golf Tournament in Wisconsin next? Not talking as much about the golf yet. A blimp deflated, burst into flames, and crashed today near the U.S. Open Golf Tournament at Aaron Hills, Wisconsin. Uh, thankfully, the pilot of the blimp was able to parachute out before it hit the ground. He was injured, though the extent of the injuries has not really been uh, discussed or released just yet. The owner of the blimp says the airship suffered exactly what you would think would be the worst thing for a blimp, a puncture that led to a catastrophic failure. The blimp is owned by AirSign, which is a national aerial advertising firm. My, my. Chrysler is recalling more than 200,000 minivans because of wiring issues. Yes, this recall involves the 2011 and 2012 Grand Caravans. Chrysler says that the vans need additional wiring protection along the steering wheel trim. If not repaired, the faulty wiring could cause the driver's side airbag to accidentally deploy. Chrysler says that they'll contact affected customers to schedule the repair. Well, a local 4 News update tonight. Residents at Detroit's Harbortown Apartments say that the building's air conditioning is finally back up and running. Uh, residents, though, said during a meeting last night they were told the building's broken elevators would not be repaired until Friday. City of Detroit fined Harbortown's management over both problems. So we will continue to monitor the progress. Mm. New at 530. Stealing from the dead. A beloved father's gravesite robbed of a priceless memento. But just wait until you see what happened once the defenders got involved. The Russia investigation is growing and could be expanding into the Oval Office. And from the State House to the Courthouse, two members of Governor Snyder's cabinet appear in court charged with involuntary manslaughter. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 530 starts now. Two members of Governor Snyder's cabinet stand silently in court as they are formally charged in the Flint water crisis. State Health Chief Nick Lyons and the state's Director of Health and Human Services, Dr. Eden Wells, appeared in court today. And they are facing, I guess what you'd say, highly unusual charges in the Flint water crisis. Rod Maloney has been following today's developments. Uh, Rod, an interesting piece of this, and there are many, but one of them is that Governor Snyder is keeping them on the job despite the fact that these charges have been filed. That's right. He has uh, decided that he wants them to stay. He is saying that they are helping with the recovery in Flint and he's backing them 100 percent, despite the requests for them to either step down or for the governor to fire them. Now, they're both out of jail on bond tonight, the two that were in court today after their arraignment. First up in Flint this morning, Dr. Eden Wells. She's charged with common law obstruction of justice and providing false testimony to special agents and threatening to withhold funding for the Flint Area Community Health and Environmental Partnership if it didn't stop an investigation into the Flint Area Legionnaires disease outbreak. Asked if she understood the charges, she said, I do, Your Honor. She pleaded not guilty. Up next, the state's top health and human services director, Nicholas Lyon. He's charged with involuntary manslaughter that you did cause the death of Robert Skidmore on December 13 of 2015 as a result of the negligent omission by you to perform a legal duty to wit by failing to alert the public about a Legionnaire's disease outbreak in Genesee County. And also intentionally withholding analysis in a Legionnaire's outbreak. And for this, he's looking at the possibility of 15 years in prison and a $7,500 fine. He too pleaded not guilty, and his attorney said after the hearing that they're going to vigorously fight the charges, saying they believe the attorney general is overreaching with his charges. Now, they're going to have probable cause hearings and preliminary exams in the next couple of weeks, and so we'll get a little bit more about this case because at the prelim is where you get much of the evidence that's against them. The larger question is who might be next? Could it be the governor? Could it be some of his staffers? Those are questions that the attorney general is not willing to answer, and we'll have to wait to see if down the road he decides to drop that bombshell. Back to you. And Rod, I know you've been looking into uh, possible penalties and what kind of time could be attached to a guilty verdict here. 
Yeah, Dr. Eden Wells uh, is facing at least four years in prison. The possibility of if she were to be found guilty with at least the $50,000 fine, her two counts are between two and four years. All right, Rod. Now to the Bill Cosby sexual assault trial. The jury says they are deadlocked. Yes, the panel of seven men and five women told the judge, told the judge this morning that after 30 hours of deliberating, they cannot reach a verdict on the three counts against Bill Cosby. But the judge told the jury to keep trying to reach a unanimous decision. If convicted, Cosby could face up to 30 years in prison. British Prime Minister Theresa May, May has, has ordered a full public investigation into the London high-rise apartment building fire that killed at least 17 people. The cause of the fire is still unknown, but residents say that there was no central fire alarm system even after an $11 million renovation. The fire chief has warned the death toll is likely to rise as the recovery operation continues. A growing investigation. Today, NBC News has confirmed that the special counsel Robert Mueller is investigating possible obstruction of justice tied to President Trump. It marks a major turn in the Russia probe, and Blaine Alexander is following that from Capitol Hill. Blaine? Well, Devin, for months now, President Trump has made it known that he is not personally under investigation, but now it appears that could be changing. Before beginning today, I'd like to... In a major development in the Russia investigation, news that it is now expanding to include questions about President Trump himself and possible obstruction of justice. Mr. President, do you believe that you are under investigation now? No answer from the president when questioned by reporters, but earlier on Twitter, he called the development the single greatest witch hunt in American political history. They made up a phony collusion with the Russian story, found zero proof, he wrote. So now they go for obstruction of justice on the phony story. Nice. NBC News has confirmed special counsel Robert Mueller will interview NSA chief Mike Rogers and also National Intelligence Director Dan Coats, who testified behind closed doors today on Capitol Hill. Legal experts say the new focus could be a game changer. What is different about this? This is a huge development because the investigation is no longer exclusively focused on a presidential campaign and concerns about collusion. Now the investigation is also looking at the sitting president of the United States. The president's legal team slammed the leak of the story as outrageous and illegal. With yesterday's shooting and promises of unity echoing across Washington, still questions today from both parties about letting Mueller's investigation run its course. It's not a witch hunt, no. I mean, I think that, you know, he's got a job to do. We all understand that. An investigation with questions now reaching into the Oval Office. And Mueller could speak with those intelligence heads as early as next week. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine, one other note here. It is unclear right now whether Andrew McCabe, who is Comey's success with the FBI, whether he's informed President Trump of the change in the scope of the investigation. We are watching a lot of hot and humid, which often means, you know. Yeah, Shh. starts to shower, and we've been seeing our share this yeah. evening. Yes, most of us don't have enough. Some of us have too much rain, and the area that we're focused on is up in Santa Lac County. That's where a flood advisory is in effect in the southern half of the county till 715. It is still raining there, especially just to the west of Peck. You can see those very red areas where the rainfall is intense. Radar estimates of over two inches of rain and there's still more to go back here to the west, not only from those areas in the northern section of Lapeer County, but more thunderstorms which are starting to fire north and east of Flint. Not much activity south of 69, just some very light scattered showers and one cell rolling out of the airport towards Gros Eel. So we'll keep an eye on this as we go forward. Even though there's no severe weather out there right now, never too early to get prepared. Let's go to our Andrew Humphrey, who was at our last severe weather radio day out at Meyer in Troy. Andrew. Well, that's right, Ben. We're out here in Royal Oak at the Meyer here talking about Weather Radio Day. We got customers here. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. You got weather radios that are actually flying off the shelf right here. And these weather radios, they are lifesavers. I have with me here Bruce Jones. Bruce, we work with you every year for Midland Radio. Thanks again for being here with us. Thank you and everybody at Channel 4. Look at these empty boxes. What with... do these empty boxes mean? Andrew, when we started this morning, they were all full of radios. So with those <laughs> that have all blown out the door, we still have some left. So please join Join us at the Meyer at Royal Oak, but I would suggest that you hasten on over. Excellent <laughs> advice there, Bruce. Thanks again. Remember, $5 off. We've got free batteries for you. This is perfect for you and your family for your safety. 
We'll see you again at 6 o'clock from the Meyer and Royal Oak. I'm Andrew Humphrey. Back to you. All right, Andrew, thank you. A Metro Detroit mother is keeping her late daughter's memory alive in a really cool way. In this week's Heart of Detroit, Mitch Album introduces us to Sandy Garbavan and her uh, Amazing Woman Foundation. I saw a shooting star and thought of you. Sandy Garbavan's daughter, Jennifer, was a child of the arts. She loved to sing and she loved to dance. But the choices she made in high school resulted in tragedy. She met a boy and that led to a life of drugs and alcohol and ultimately the car accident that took her life. Once she passed away, I thought, I, I have to do something so that people will know that she was a great person. Through her grief, Sandy established an Amazing Woman Foundation in honor of her daughter. My goal for this organization is to create an environment for young women to feel empowered, for them to gain confidence, for them to know that they are worth so much more. So that they don't have to fall in with a group just to have some sense of belonging. Exactly. An Amazing Woman Foundation is dedicated to keeping young women ages 10 through 18 on the right path, providing them an opportunity to pursue a passion within the arts that may have been unreachable before. We have the girls write a application letter, tell us why this is important to you and what it is you hope to gain from the experience. Four to six requests are fulfilled each year and Sandy is so pleased to see these young ladies involved in activities that her daughter once loved. It just really makes me happy to know that they're doing something that they're enjoying and that they're getting something out of it. Honoring the memory of her lost daughter, Sandy Garbavan is providing opportunity and empowerment to young ladies right here in the heart of Detroit. Such a great way to honor her life. It certainly is. Well, it may be one of the most unusual summer jobs we can find. Yeah, so new here at 530, what these kids are trying out for that requires a whole lot of skill and some luck too. And talk about a crazy motive, why this man says he tried to rob a bank. It has absolutely nothing to do with money. We'll explain it in just a minute. A father's gravesite robbed, his family heartbroken. How low could you be? But after the local four defenders report what happened, the family's cherished reminder of their dad is replaced. The story next. And as we head to break, a quick reminder, I hope you'll tune in at 8 o'clock tonight to Local 4. Our white boy Rick story coming your way, Defender Kevin Dietz. Kimberly Gill and myself will be, have uh, rare insights into Rick Worshi's fight for freedom and a look at what's next in the case. 8 o'clock tonight on Local 4. You know, we became